Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 774. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is November 29th, 2022. All right, well, thank you for joining us for another show of Anglican Unscripted. You don't just have to watch us. We do come in podcast format as well. You will find a link in the show notes. Um, I'm really hopped up on caffeine, and we, we in, the, in the pre-show, I'm going, so I'm going to try and slow down my talking a little bit so I can enunciate, and you can hear me, and George can, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I got a better point than that. So, George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing semi-okay. I We got a late start this morning on filming because I had to go to the eye doctor uh, because I have a sty in one of my eyes. And mm-hmm. um, with uh, all these dogs and puppies, all of them licking me, I think, uh, oh, they lick me. Well, first they lick the cat's butt, cat's then they butt, lick yeah. themselves, <laughs> then they lick my face. <laughs> and I think uh, I have cat butt germs in my eye. So I had to go see the doctor and get creams and all this stuff. So... <laughs> Your mother was right. Uh, don't uh, don't let the puppy lick your face. Don't let the puppy. But they have sty gel they can put in your eye now, so that that's good. Yeah, advancements in technology. Um, yeah, we're doing great. We have relocated up here to Connecticut for a couple of days, cleaning out the storage lockers and doing some uh, other stuff, and having my third Thanksgiving for uh, 2022. Yay! <clears throat> and so, be a lot of fun. Uh, but there's a lot of news to cover. Before we get there, uh, we value your comments. Please go to the comment section. Tell us what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show, or your opinion on the topics that we talk about. If you're not subscribed yet, a great time to subscribe uh, to the show. You'll see a red rectangle. You'll see a bell pop up after you click that. You click the bell, you will be instantly notified every time there's a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. And as you've seen in the past month, we've had some other contributors. We had Jeff Walton and we had Calvin Robinson from the UK uh, pop up on screen and do a wonderful interview with us. And we're trying to to expand a little bit in the program because uh, we find that George and I are getting busier and busier and having more doctor's appointments than we need because of our our age restrictions. All right, George, let's move on to our first story. There's a lot of news this week. Let me find the uh, news template. Uh, China is going through a mini revolt. Now, you guys of my age in the 50s remember the Tiananmen Square revolt that was going on. It was a student-led protest in Tiananmen Square that was shut down violently after a couple weeks by the Communist Party who said, "Um, listen, that's just not how we're going to go. We're not going to have another revolt here in China. We've had enough of those over the centuries. And they basically disappeared. Uh, We don't know how many, but the the guest statements are about 400 people just poofed, gone, uh, because they were uh, protesting China. You're really not allowed to do that until now. Post-COVID, I'm watching on video protests happening around the provinces, not just in student-led Tiananmen, but uh, in in most of the provinces right now in China, there are many revolts going on, whether it be labor, whether it be about the drought, food shortages, um, and COVID lockdowns. I'm like... This is kind of getting out of hand if you're a communist member of the party and you want to keep control, George. I would say, Kevin, that I think this is a major revolt, and I actually think it's more deeper and fundamental than what happened at Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, spark may be the COVID lockdowns, where the government of uh, uh, Xi Jinping has been enforcing these draconian lockdowns where people are wired into the the doors of their apartment buildings are welded shut and the uh, the covid lockdowns to prevent the transmission of disease now of course that's farcical it's non-scientific that's not how it works but the party can't be wrong and the party can the par- the communist party believes it's infallible believes it's invincible and it believes that human nature and science are entirely malleable you can change it if the party disagrees the party's the final arbiter now social media is new it's playing a role in all of this and kevin 
it wasn't 10 years ago if you said bad things you'd be disappeared it was 10 days ago hmm. but the as i understand it there was a uh, an apartment building fire in the western city of uh, Urumqi. And the building, the residents had been welded into the building. The, the door has been welded shut because they were under COVID lockdown. Well, a fire broke out and their videos on the internet were shared where you see this building going up like a candle and people screaming, help, let me out, let me out. And they all burned to death because they were wired into their buildings and their neighbors were wired into their buildings. There was nobody to help. This passed around and we're seeing protests from Western China to Peking to Shanghai, all the way down to the South in major cities and small cities. And the extraordinary thing is millions of middle-class ordinary Chinese are arresting our uh, risking arrest, torture, even death, but for and calling for the out downfall of the CCP. This is extraordinary. And there are really only two ways forward. Another Tiananmen Square where the government comes out swinging, arrests its opponents, and that will include, sadly, the leaders of the Christian churches, even if they've been on the sidelines, that the you know, Christians, their foreign, you know, foreign influencers they will be rounded up and disappeared, just like uh, in the past. Uh, past waves of repression have focused on Christian Christians, among mm -hmm. others. Uh, or the government's going to fall. Now, maybe a reformist will come in and lead the CCP, or maybe the CCP itself will collapse. Um, but this, the, the, the uh, their COVID frustrations, their labor frustrations, their strikes at the Foxcom and the Apple plants in China, because, you know, they're being worked 16 hours a day, they're paid next to nothing. And it, with COVID, they've been forced to live at the factories in some cases. Yeah. And no, in, in many cases. But one of the, the weird components here is where will the Chinese army itself end up? Will it be part of a coup? Uh, or will it follow the instructions of the, the current leadership of the CCP and just uh, shoot without destruction, you know, without discretion? Another Tiananmen Square, but in, in every province. Well, the officer class will certainly follow the party because all the senior officers are members of the party. Mm -hmm. It's the uh, guy with the rifle. We And we actually may see, uh, there were some films circulating, and if you go onto YouTube, you will see some Westerners who are pro-communist hacks. They're paid people who basically give, oh, this is limited, this is just you know, local officials, uh, people are protesting. No, it's not. Uh, now, I don't speak Chinese, so I can't interpret what I'm seeing, but what people who do speak Chinese and have posted these, you know, it's F the CCP, F uh, Xi Jinping, down with him, may he rot in hell. This is unprecedented. You know, this is... This lead you to be arrested and taken away a, a week ago and but i saw one video where uh 40 policemen surround this man who was protesting and they start to haul him away and the crowd rescued the man the crowd of bystanders rescued the man that's unheard of in china china you don't step so and here's the what was also unheard the police didn't pull out their guns or their clubs and hit back at the mob who will rescue the man. Is the, are the police forces wavering? I don't know. Now, she knows what happened to Muammar Gaddafi. He knows what happened to Chauce Nikolai Ceausescu. He knows what happened to uh, dictators in the past. The, the, it's only if you're an American-friendly dictator like Papa Doc de Valier do you get to retire in the French Riviera with your ill-gotten gains. It's either death or total power. And so it's really going to go one of two ways. He's He's got to be carried out on a stretcher. Uh, if there's going to be regime change. But I think I'm fearful that things will get bloody before they get better. I think one of the ironic things we're seeing here, yes, communism, uh, used to work in a vacuum over in uh, the Soviet Union, it used to work in a vacuum over in China. But now that vacuum has 
powerful forces with tech. Uh, Apple itself uh, is uh, agreed to stop file sharing between its iPhones for people who live in China. Uh, Apple has agreed that there will be a, a, a Chinese only app store. So you can't get some of these communication products that help you uh, uh, work and lead a revolt. And it's interesting because I mentioned, mentioned Apple. Apple is famous for its 1984 commercial where uh, in, in the intro to the Olympics, you saw this commercial where Apple was protesting against the machine, protesting against Big Brother. Well, now it is the machine. Apple right now is Big Brother, just as bad as China. So let's move on to some other news, George. Um, oh, sad news to report. Uh, Bishop John Rogers, uh, former dean of Trinity Seminary in uh, Amesbury, Pennsylvania, has passed on, George. Yes, he died, uh, I think it was Sunday or Monday this past weekend. And he had... Uh... He was a wonderful leader of the church. His students loved him. He was a very powerful, masculine uh, advocate of uh, evangelical Anglicanism. And his kind uh, isn't being reproduced, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, a Marine veteran, uh, educated in Switzerland after the war, um, just just an incredible fellow. He formed, he was one of the founders of Trinity Seminary. He left Virginia Seminary because it had started down the path toward modernism and revisionism. And he helped, he started an old AMP, a grocery store in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, and basically founded the, now the most successful, the Episcopal Seminaries, or former Episcopal Seminaries. The, now I think it's an Anglican Seminary. Because it was founded yeah. as Trinity Episcopal School for <laughs> Ministry, and they took out the E in the abbreviation. It's now TSM. Yeah. It is. So, uh, um, it, it's, it's wonderful to read some of the uh, comments online on Facebook and uh, other places about his wonderful life of ministry. Just to, he, he started good and ended good. You don't see that very often in Anglicanism. Uh, let's move over to the uh, Church of England um, and talk about the Bishop of Ramsbury. And... It, it, it's a weird story because any other time there's a story about uh, a former bishop or current bishop uh, being accused of and convicted of a heinous sex crime, uh, the Church of England is quick to convict and quick to publicize that. I'll uh, put out in the air for you, George Bell, you know, or uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, uh, George Carey. Ah, but Kevin, both of them weren't guilty. Uh, they were slandered. Know, just the opposite. Slandered they were that. slandered by the Church of England, and the guilty people, they have to pull teeth, uh, Peter Balls, uh, to get the church to say something or do something. Peter Hollow was the uh, Bishop of Ransbury. Uh, it's, a suffragan, it's a suffragan assistant position. And he had been the uh, headmaster of the Cheltenham Music School, which is a uh, prestigious uh, music uh, school, um, and when he was there, he uh, uh, sexually abused two women. And the he then, this was 20 odd years ago, he became bishop, retired oh, over 10 years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And the complaints were filed. And in August, a secret uh, hearing was held and he agreed to plead guilty. He agreed to step down from the ministry and he was given a ban for life. And in return, they wouldn't have a public trial and they keep the whole thing secret. Well, and they did uh, keep the whole thing secret. I mean, seriously, I've never heard of this. You and I hear the ground uh, swell all the time about what's going on uh, in certain dioceses around the world, not just the Church of England. We would have heard something. Well, we, if we had probably thought about it, and when I don't think about Peter Hull at night, so I probably never would have. <laughs> When he was the director of music at the school where he was headmaster, uh, was convicted and I think imprisoned for abusing students. And part of his crimes were that he basically uh, said, you know, go find another job. And uh, this fellow who was later convicted of abusing children, the music director, uh, was given a government uh, honor and all this and that until. It, the victims came forward. So Hullah was involved in the cover-up. And the church, and here again, the Church of England, 
you know, it's got such a bad problem with the perception. Now, abuse in the Church of England is no worse than it is in the public schools or in any other larger institution. Just the Church of England handles it so badly, it prevaricates, it covers up, it excuses, or it makes, uh, uh, or it victimizes uh, innocent people or and ignores the victims. And this Hullock case is just another example. We'll just keep this whole thing quiet because we, you know, don't want people to know that another bishop has gone round the bend and has uh, done things that are terrible. We sometimes complain about how the ACNA has handled uh, some of its more recent uh, uh, problems in, in this type of area, but the Church of England sets the bar so high on how to do it wrong and bad and evil that uh, you probably won't find me complaining that much about the ACNA anymore. This is just atrocious. They never treat bishops the same way twice. Well, we, we can always, well, there's always the Catholic Church in the United States if you want yeah, somebody who does it worse. Uh, the Catholic bishops just appointed the Bishop of Richmond to be the head of the child abuse uh, investigations and all this and that. Mm -hmm. Now, this fellow was Theodore McCarrick's secretary, the pervert Cardinal of Washington. And he was the heavy guy who basically shut up all the people who complained, made sure people were exiled to farthest Okeechobee if they were going to offer a complaint. And before McCarrick and, and for his troubles, he was made Bishop of Richmond. So the guy who was the enforcer, the cover-up, fellow from McCarrick, who was eventually def defrocked, the first cardinal that I can think of, and the only American cardinal to be defrocked for uh, this sort of stuff. Uh, he's now in charge of the whole abuse process, the guy who led the cover-ups for McCarrick for years. Now, the Church of England has not yet reached that level of mendacity, but give it time. Give it, Give time. it time. They have something uh, a goal to reach for, you know. So, oh, what a mess. All right, let's talk a little bit. Hey, next story. If you can't compete, just forfeit. Give up. Uh, I wrote down here that the World Cup is to supersede the carol services in the Church of England. Now, the carol services there are famous. If you're here in America, you probably never heard of it. So, George, let, let's talk a little bit about the event itself. It's traditional in the Church of England on the afternoon of the fourth Sunday of Advent, which this year is uh, December 18th, to have carol services, Christmas carol services and whatnot. And it's actually one of the more well-attended things in the Church of England because people come because they like the singing, they like the anticipation of Christmas. And for many mm, casual churchgoers, this is sort of when they reconnect this and then Christmas Eve and boom, they're done till Easter. Well, the final of the World Cup, which is the soccer game, uh, is scheduled for the that ad, that afternoon. And so the Church of England has this website, sort of ministry notes, things, you know, how to run your parish, that sort of thing. And they said, they suggested that, uh, as Kevin said, that the Church of England forfeit and not uh, attempt to hold carol services during the World Cup. Maybe instead you could hold a a mat, you know, invite people to the parish hall to watch the final of the World Cup instead of worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, I can see where they're going, but man, this is a this just reeks of desperation and failure. That's mindset. I can't. We can't counter program against the World Cup. Therefore, worshiping the Lord goes out the door. Uh, if you want to, if you want to have a uh, something that just symbolizes the utter fecklessness of the Church of England, I think this is a this advice. Uh, yeah, that, it takes the cake for twenty twenty two, but they'll do they'll do more in twenty twenty three. Well, we so. still have another month, Kevin. I mean, give it you time. Give it, <laughs> give it time. All right. Um, oh, next story on here is. Uh, uh, a professor from, not a professor, a student, doctoral student from uh, Cambridge says that Jesus is transgender during his service. He pointed to some pictures and to prove his point, people in the audience, which I was surprised, yelled heresy. And I said, well, once you yell heresy, you're going to make Anglican unscripted. What's the story, George? 
Well, this is one of those few religion stories that make it across the blood-brain barrier between the church news and secular news. Sure. So you can see this on Breitbart, on Fox News, all the uh, all the sort of conservative websites have picked this up and are just beating the drums. And most of them have it wrong, uh, but in detail, but not in substance. A research fellow, and a research fellow at a, at a Cambridge college is a recent uh, doctoral student who basically is starting on the ladder towards an academic career. And oddly enough, this fellow's uh, PhD advisor was a man named Rowan Williams. Okay, he this fellow gave a sermon in a college chapel, and he's talking about uh, the crucifixion wounds of Jesus, and he's remarking how in some medieval art, they're remarkably similar to a vagina. You know, that hole in Jesus' side was looked like vagina. And, okay, we got some whacked out graduate student. This is somebody my children's age, okay? We're not talking yes. about a mature theologian whose views are those that we... We got some dumb kid preaching, uh, probably for the first times or whatever, in the college chapel. Well, of course, he said stupid things and people are upset. And they complained to the dean of the chapel, the, the chaplain of the college, who said, well, that's not really what he was saying. But, you know, he defended the students' right to say stupid things. It is the Church of England, after all. We don't expect good or sound preaching. And the dean's defense has translated into Fox News headlines of Cambridge academics say Jesus is transgender. No, some kid said this, and the dean of the chapel is defending him against other people. But, oh, Kevin, gosh. Well, hold on. Hey, I'll, I'll give you a hint. If this person had graduated from Tessum, you would not have heard this gobbledygook come from uh, a doctoral student out of Tessum, you know, so. Well, Kevin, academics... <laughs> Well, here's the thing, Kevin. The kid's not dumb. He's now a somebody. He's, he's now somebody, got an right. academic career. <laughs> oh, and he's, yeah. you get ahead in academic. He's a, he's a white male who's not gay that I know of. So, uh, yeah. so being a white male, he has no job prospects, none whatsoever in academia, and I'm, in England or in the UK. But if he's got something outrageous to say that sort of falls into the woke academic worldview, this kid is not going to get a job somewhere. So even if he didn't believe what he was saying, it was a smart move for his career. Far from ending it, this is ensuring it. Because sure. this guy doesn't want to go back and be a parish priest somewhere with, his, with all those years of parish priest, of, of, of academic work down the drain. He wants to find a good job. And this is one way to do it. Well, I mean, this is what statements like this made Jack Spong famous and made Absolutely. him Bishop Material. This will make the student Bishop Material one day, you know. Well, it'll sell books. I mean, it'll Jack Spong was basically a theological ignoramus, but because he was bishop of a diocese, some people um, paid attention to him. Um, great example, Richard Dawkins, you know, uh, famous atheist, couldn't put a sentence together, a paragraph together without a fallacy if he tried. But he's got that thing going. You know, he's, he's, he's hit a trigger in a certain age group and makes him famous. All right, uh, let's talk about a headline I sent you. The Crown Prosecution Committee says the Bible may be inappropriate if read in public. And this is based on uh, a case that's going on there where a street preacher I uh, used a Bible verse uh, to confront a lesbian couple. He was prosecuted for that, and now we find that the Bible was at fault, George. I don't know if this, yes, that's a good, fair summary. Uh, mm -hmm. a, lo a Crown Prosecution Service attorney, it's a prosecutor, mm -hmm. made the claim that this was hate speech and that portions of Scripture are now inappropriate in the modern age to say. Paul's injunctions against uh, uh, Pornea, the old Levitical uh, pr prohibitions against uh, homosexuality. Now, I don't know if this is policy, and I don't know if this is just some whacked out, you know, lawyer. 
But Kevin, the conservatives supposedly have been in power for 10 years, the Tories in England, right. and they run the Home Office, or they should. They should. And yet it's under the conservatives that we've had the worst of the worst excesses of wokeness in British society. Um, so I don't know. It's just the government so incompetent that it it lets you know the the loony loosey goosey looney tune element within the civil service run wild and without supervision, or is there a serious move within what we would the American equivalent would be the Republicans to push the gay agenda, to push the atheist liberal agenda? Um, well, I just I don't understand this aspect of British life where you have a well, government have that says they're conservative but is indistinguishable from the, the, the opposition left. I think we, we display that here in America as well because it takes so long to empty the swamp. If mm -hmm. the Tories come to power, well, you have people in there who have government jobs that you can't just kick out. There has to be a, a transition where some of these have to age out of their jobs or move on. Uh, not every government job is appointed. And it takes a long time, especially here in America, to get federal judges replaced. Um, and the, so that's a pendulum. Die, <laughs> yes, they could die. You know, the, we have that pendulum that this moves so slowly back and forth here in American politics. It's a little different uh, in uh, certainly European and UK politics, where, yes, you can have a party in control, but the swamp is full and it stinks. And you see these types of things happen where the Bible is now in, inappropriate to read in public. I don't mind that headline. My anger, and I'm very angry about this, is nobody in the Church of England, no bishop, no archbishop of Canterbury, said, uh, no, it's not inappropriate. That's well along you. know, the Church of England has taken no official stand on this other than to be silent, George. And, you know, this is perfect opportunity for some bishop to be clever and cite Paul saying the, the scripture is a scandal to the Greeks. Yes, uh, you is. know, <laughs> that uh, Christ died for your sins. That's scandalous. I mean, the leadership of the Church of England on so many levels has failed the English people. Uh, and this is just illustration of many millionth that we've had. How long have we been doing having Anglican unscripted, Kevin? And uh, Forever. Forever. Yeah, I, and sure. well, 774 <laughs> episodes <laughs> worth. Episodes, yeah. And, you know, this story could have appeared in episode 274 or 74, and it'll reappear mm -hmm. in episode 974 of, of gormless bishops unable to stand for what is true and right. Well, the most watched episode of Anglican Unscripted is one I did with Gavin where we accused the Church of England of being a hoax church. I'll put that episode in the show notes in case you're new and you haven't watched it. And it really is, on so many different levels, a hoax. They don't defend the gospel. They don't defend their clergy. They don't defend anything except jobs for the boys. Mm -hmm. you know, that They are an institution uh, that is much more Gnostic and secular than Christian. Hasn't changed. So, all right. Complaint letters can be sent to George Conger. Yes. All right. So let's move on. Uh, this is just our, our uh, Church of England episode. Living, love, and faith process is falling apart. We know this because we've been contacted by the Global South, who are going to publish a letter tomorrow that we have ready to go. And according to sources, it pertains to the future of the Sea of Canterbury if the living love and faith committee and process goes bad. It's called the St. Andrew's Day letter because November 30th is St. Andrew's Day, and it's been embargoed until tomorrow. And it's, but we can say it's been authored by Munira Nice, who is, if you will, the leader, along with Justin Badirama of South Sudan, of the Global South movement. And we can't disclose its contents. But we can remind people what was said at the Lambeth Conference by Archbishop Justin uh, Badirama, not Welby, 
<laughs> and other Global South leaders, which is uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury assume has an assumption that he will always be the first among equals. And that needs to be reconsidered if the Church of England goes over the edge. Um, so we'll, we'll stop there because we don't want to violate, you know, that's what was said in the past at Lambeth. Uh, we really can't give the details. But what I think is interesting is we're seeing, let's talk about on the ground reality in these dioceses, like the Diocese of Oxford, to what's been going on. Diocese of Oxford is where the uh, bishop uh, and his uh, three uh, area bishops all back this, uh, the bishop's letter calling for gay marriage. And there have the Oxford Evangelical Diocesan Fellowship responded, the Church of England Evangelical Council responded, and the rector of St. Aldate's responded, with, oh, I'm sorry, St. Ebbs, another parish in, in Oxford, responded in different ways. And then we had parishes uh, like one in Banbury, where its rector wrote a letter uh, to on the internet, basically saying that he was seriously thinking of redirecting his parish share to the Oxford Good Stewards uh, Fellowship Trust. Uh, well, in the Diocese of Southwark, for a number of years, conservatives have been able to, re to direct the money that they would normally send to the diocese to this trust, which then distributes, distributes it to those uh, parishes that need support. And so, on, but this fellow in Banbury immediately came under tremendous pressure, such that he asked us to take down his letter. And he also contacted Anglican Mainstream, which also published his letter, and asked them to take it down. Well, poor fellow doesn't understand how the internet works. Uh, people only read the story if it's uh, less than a week old. And yeah. he asked about a week into it to take it down. So it's no skin off our nose. But, you know, you don't want to fight with people like that. No. But he's under tremendous pressure by the archdeacons and the establishment to toe the line. So we're seeing various things forming. We're seeing what I would call the pan-Anglican response, which is the global south stepping in and saying, Justin, if you go over the edge with living in love and faith and have gay marriage or gay blessings, consider yourself uninvited to the primates meetings the next time around. Uh, that pan-Anglican approach has been what, you know, GAFCON focused on and the Global South is focusing on and what worked in the United States and formed the Anglican Church in North America it has not yet worked in England. The Anglican network in Europe is just getting off the ground. But will this pan-Anglican approach where the outsider comes in to save the church work? Don't know. We'll have to see. Then well, you have I the establishment evangelicals. And the establishment evangelicals, they're willing to dialogue. That's the Church of England Evangelical Council. will be a faithful remnant and... We will be part of a resistance, but we will be faithful. Resistance and fidelity. That's, that's uh, attacked as compromise by some. By others, it's applauded as wisdom. Why run away when the fight's not yet over? Now, it's the same thing we saw in the United States. Um, if you remember, one of the first big churches to leave the Episcopal Church was uh, Christ Church in Plano. David Roseberry was the rector. And I remember at the time, David Roseberry saying that it was not his idea. In fact, he wanted to stay in the diocese, Episcopal Diocese of Dallas, but his lay leadership wanted out. And he basically bowed to the wishes of the congregation. Will we see that happen in the Church of England? In other words, in these big evangelical parishes, will the people say, look, we got to get out and the priests follow? Because in the, in the places where the people have something to lose, they're less likely to jump than in the smaller parishes. Well, and I think to we saw about... that. I'm sorry. Well, I think well, we saw that here in America. You know, a lot of the uh, growth in the ACNA and the desire to to form something like that was done at the lay level. It mm -hmm. wasn't done, at, you know, at a senior bishop level until Catherine Jefferts Shorey decided I'm going to start deposing left and right, and ended up deposing some 770 priests. And I think in the Church of England. 
uh, because of the pressure that can be applied to priests and bishops, the future rests in the laity. And we've seen lay-led organizations start to raise up and say, um, we relied on the priest to do this, we relied on the clergy to take control of uh, the Church of England, and we take Christ for England. They're not doing good. We're going to have to step in. Well, it's one of the reasons why the ordinariate in England has failed, because it's a clergy initiative. And it does have lay members, but it's it's the mo power behind it has been former Church of England clergy. Now, they just did Gavin Ashton dirty. They basically told him to piss off. They don't want him part of the ordinariate because they don't want any bad press that Gavin might up rock the boat about his right with his writings, which is extraordinarily stupid. I'm sorry, just stupid of these people. Yeah. You have one of the great stars of English Christianity who wants to be part on your team. And you said, oh, he might offend some junior bureaucrat in Rome. Therefore, we need to need to show him the door. But hey, this is Anglican unscripted, not Catholic yeah. unscripted. Well, I, I wanted to mention something that appeared on Jan O'Zane's Via Media website. A man named Simon, 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 what's your last name? Simon, Simon Butler. He's a former member of the Archbishop's Council, former member of General Synod. He's a gay priest. And he let the cat out of a bag about out of the bag about something called the Saint Hugh conversations. Now we had heard sort of things, but nobody's ever really said anything on the record. Well, Simon wrote something on the record saying that there have been conversations for many years between liberals and conservatives about a way forward on the human sexuality issue. And of course, Simon says, We're we liberals are going to win because it's the right thing and all this and that. His points in his favor of his cause aren't really that interesting because we've heard it many times before. What I found interesting was his characterization of the conservative opposition, and that is that they're all over the place. There's some who are willing to compromise. There's some who will not compromise. There are some who will say one thing in public and do another thing in private. And that failure of the conservatives to unite means in Simon's mind that we've won the battle. And I don't think he's that wrong. What yeah, made, the, a what made yeah. the ACNA survive and prosper was that you could have, you had leaders like Bob Duncan and Jack Iker and Keith Ackerman, mm -hmm. uh, John David Schofield, bishops, willing to stand and take the consequences for their actions. And you could, Bob Duncan would a, was able to gather under his wing people all across from the Pentecostal Anglicans to the uh, Ang high, Ang so Anglo-Catholic, the, the uh, Romano Anglican Catholics uh, you know, who used the Roman Missal, all were able to stand under Bob's leadership. Bob Duncan ordained women priests, yet the Anglo-Catholics who are against women priests came on board. There is no, Simon Butler is right in that there is no one leader who can corral all these people into line. Now, the problem with the St. Hugh conversations is we had saw these sort of private conversations in the United States as well at the time. But because they were private and because you know, oh, my buddy, he's an evangelical. Let's ask him to join the conversation. That fellow may have no following or standing whatsoever. And so basically, it's just a conversation of friends. So it's not a real conversation of any sort. But it's, you know, it's sort of problematic that we can't talk about the St. Andrew's Day statement because this is really a major thing that's going to come down tomorrow. And of course, we'll talk about it next week. But but uh, let me just circle back about one thing I do want to mention. Uh, I got an email from one of our viewers in Hong Kong, who's a, an Anglican priest. He said, oh, by the way, did you know that the head of the USPG, and his name is Duncan Dormer, is going to come and lead the clergy conference the Diocese of Hong Kong? No, I didn't know that. And we have a number of priests who will be boycotting that because the head of the USPG, one of the ancient mission societies based in England, is pro-gay, pro-transgender. Now, 
if you look, trying to think through this, why have not all of the Global South joined up with the Global South? Why is Central Africa and West Africa and other places like that slow to join the bandwagon? Well, they're USPG clients. The money comes from that mission society. The CMS people have all joined up, but not the USPG people. So when you have the Canadian Church and Trinity Wall Street and some American diocese and others uh, conditioning their support on voting the right way and saying and doing the right things in public, uh, the pan-Anglican model is never really going to be the clincher, I think because money is still talking. Now, I think the clergy in Hong Kong are being emboldened by what they're seeing in China, where the average person is standing up and saying, no, it's enough. So we're now seeing Chinese Anglican clergy saying, no, we're not going to make polite because we've got another Englishman who's genteel and uh, went to the right schools and this and that. He's a heretic and we're not going to participate in his work in his time so we get back to the first story the world is on fire and it's the fire is based in china yeah and this is a, a different dynamic completely because back in the days of the tiananmen square there were three or four journalist cameras I, cnn was there uh, and some others in today's world every citizen in china has a little iphone or a phone which is a video phone and they can record these events as they happen and it, as you're seeing the videos of the protests on um the internet and youtube you're seeing these protests because the citizens are taking the video and smuggling it out of the country and that's that's the big change from uh what we saw before this we, we talked about the arab spring a couple of years ago um I, I don't know what's going to happen in China. Uh, history tells me it'll end in a bloodbath, but I, I hope I'm wrong. And I do encourage the, if the English bishops are watching, I've spoken, I've been email communication with one fellow who's now retired, but is of tremendous influence, who is saying, you know, what the Bishop of Oxford did, that's one of the steps towards this establishment that's going to split the Church of England. How could the guy be so damn stupid? And Justin Welby must have known and given him the okay to go forward. And so this guy is basically ready to take Justin Welby to task. And I say, well, just say this. Just say this out loud. No, he's not going to say it out loud just because that's not how they do things in England. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't want to just point to this being a uh, a power struggle with the Church of England. It's kind of how people in that society work. The English, British, UK people are less ferocious than us Americans. You know, you, you we expected uh, when we formed an ACNA over here and we started retaking uh, uh, many parts of this country for Christ, that it would be easy to replicate in England and in the UK. It's not easy to replicate at all. It, different individuals, different individualism, and a different um, idealism on how to do something. It's working in Brazil. The Anglican Church of Brazil, Miguel Ochoa, yeah. that's working. Yeah. Their problem is that they're just starved for cash because Brazil's a poor country, relatively yeah. speaking, compared to the United States. If they had money to invest in seminary education to train more clergy, this guy's the limit in Brazil because in many ways it, it's more akin to the, it's much more akin to the US than the UK or Europe is. But um, there's just such opportunity. Kevin, I'll, I'll argue with, there is a power struggle going on, but it's not between men, it's between principalities and powers. Sure. I think, I don't wish to call anyone a demon, but the demonic plays such a major role in all of this, where Satan seeks to mislead and lie and devour and cower, cause us to cower in fear and not stand for what is true and right and faithful. No. There is a power struggle. It's between the St. Michael and all the archangels and Satan. 
but he already won that battle. So why are we not? Why are we resisting Satan further like this and letting him do all this stuff? Uh, because we are people who like to be comfortable, especially in 2022. And look how uncomfortable we are watching China. Ooh, ooh I hope nobody gets hurt. Well, you know, seven's going to get hurt. And you need to put this into your prayers. You know, we need to pray uh, that in the end, after all the blood has been spilt and uh, freedom has been fought for and hopefully won, that uh, Christ and uh, God can be glorified in us. How? Just pray. Just pray. All right, that brings us to the end of episode 774. I hope you've enjoyed your uh, 45 minutes of entertainment from Kevin and George. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 774 of Anglican Unscripted.